Hey folks, we have our seventh edition of the rules discussion. <clears throat> I just wanted to say thank you everyone that came out to the uh, umpire clinic. <clears throat> Had a pretty decent turnout from each different leagues. Also, thanks everybody for coming out to these each week. I know we have some, uh, some people watching on the district site now. We have it broadcasting there. Uh, so we got that. We have also have um, anybody on YouTube. So you guys on YouTube, if you have any questions or anything like that, feel free to throw those at us. And then, of course, anybody can join here. If you have a Google G Plus account, <clears throat> you can come on and join. So we appreciate everybody. With that, let me go ahead and kick in and get started right here onto the rules. I'm going to pull up on my screen uh, the first rule. We're going to we're doing in section three game preliminaries. It's very very basic and and I'm not going to go over a whole lot in rule 301 or 302 because they're pretty standard as far as that goes. You can follow along in your book if you like. Let me pull this up real quick. <clears throat> but we are going to go to oops sorry wrong one. <laughs> Let me get the correct screen pulled up. Okay, there we go. Yeah. All right, if we look at rule number 303, and number three, it says pitchers once removed from the mound may not return as pitchers. Okay, this is different uh, from high school. High school, you can do this. And also, um, like... Other leagues, you trip and different things like that, and even you cannot return to the mound. Now, if you notice in the next sentence, under intermediate, junior, seniors, and big league, you actually can. So they follow a lot along with uh, high school ball, which allows you to do that. So be sure and read that one and not get it confused. But little league, you cannot return. You cannot return to the mound. So wanted to emphasize that and make sure that we're – Everyone's all on the same page on that one. Um, the other, let's see, that that's it on that particular rule. Um, let's see, yeah, and then it goes on, and if you look at rule 303, it has big league down below that, and then it has senior big league designated hitter rule. I mean, obviously, these don't apply to uh, little league. Uh, we don't have a designated hitter in little league. You don't use that. It's just for the older boys, so that's why it's in there and it explains that. Okay, let me go on to the next, which will be, let me get back to the screen share. Rule 304, basically it says right there, no courtesy runner in Little League. Player whose name is on the team's batting order may not become a substitute runner for any other member of the team. Courtesy runner is not permitted. We have a local option at Northwood that we have implemented in our local rules to run for the catcher just to speed up the game, or we make it mandatory with two outs. If you forget it, no big deal. I think we talked about this last week a little bit. If you'll notice, these rules repeat themselves quite a bit, which I don't think is a bad thing because it keeps up with different things in different sections, so... Just keep that in mind um, that we do at Northwood just use for the catcher just to speed the game up, especially if you have a minors game where <laughs> it's going He's on forever. Uh, no, no outs or one out? <clears throat> that is correct. That is okay. correct. But it is mandatory once there's two outs, it does become mandatory Dylan. at that point. Dylan. Yeah. Rule 305, if you look, just uh, uh, I believe it's the second sentence in 401B, it says, shall, uh, shall pitch to the first batter or any substitute batter thereof. Both of these rules here on A and B, basically what they're saying is is that they have to pitch to that first batter unless that player, unless the pitcher is like pulls a muscle or whatever and has to come out of the game. But if that does happen, the the key there is is that he will not be able to go back to pitcher at any point after that point in that game. So I think I made that clear. Does everybody understand that one? Everybody get that? Okay, good. I just want to make sure. Um, let's see. Let me go down to 309. Pull this back up again if I can pull the right one. Rule 309. <clears throat> Basic, the basic one here is the sentence that says, and I'll see if I can highlight it so you guys, can you see that highlighted? Mm -hmm. Good. 
manager and coaches must not warm up nice. a pitcher at home plate or in the bullpen or elsewhere at any time. They may, however, stand to observe a pitcher during warm-ups in the bullpen. Okay? So you cannot warm up a pitcher. This is a very big no-no in Little League. Uh, I know all other leagues do it. This one does not. So <clears throat> just wanted to make sure that everyone knows that one. How, now, however, if he's standing up and throwing with a kid, let's say they don't have enough players or the manager wants to go down and they don't have a catcher or they don't have enough team members, the manager could go throw with them, but he can't get down into a kneeling position and catch. He can have a glove on. It's just like a dad and a kid throwing ball. Now, There's is that in the bullpen? Anywhere. So he could go to the plate and stand up and... He can stand up. I mean, I, we, we don't advertise this. We don't encourage this. Cause I've because I've never let him do anything. Well, and that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's nothing in there that says that a, boy, uh, you know, a dad can't throw with his kid. I mean, seriously, I doubt Little League would uh, oppose to that. And what's the harm there? I mean, is there any harm? I mean, th think about it logically, safety-wise. I think the biggest thing is is they're down. Mm -hmm. They're in a dangerous position. Um you know, anything kneeling or bending over or anything like that. But if he's just throwing just to keep his arm, I, I don't. I can't see anything wrong with that. And really, I don't think there is. I mean, I, I mean, so, I'll probably research that a little bit more. And I think I did last year. Is why I even, I'm even bringing it, bringing it up. But because I've never let him, I'm just saying. You know, you would think it's either or. You either can do it or you can't. Yeah, and that, and that's a valid point. But I mean, if you if you look at what they're saying is warming up a pitcher. I mean, that again, there's so many. It's kind of like what I talked about in the in the meeting. There's so many gray areas. What does that mean? I'm not warming them up. I'm just throwing with them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying? I, I mean, know exactly what you're saying. <laughs> and I'd just assume, especially when it's cooler and things like that, that the kid gets warm and ready to pitch. Um, there's nothing wrong with him throwing to somebody else, though. He can get another kid up there, get a helmet on, whatever the case needs to be. So, um, I don't know. <laughs> That's just kind of my thoughts on it. And then, and I'll, I'll get that a, a total answer on that. So we ha have that. That's going to be something I can bring up for the next time or whatever. Okay. Back to the screen share. Okay. Rule number 310 under B. Basically, under A, it's saying that the uh, m both managers must agree on the fitness of the field. That's all good, and in, in, in our, in our uh, board members make that decision at Northwood, too, whether the field playable, safe, and all that kind of stuff to start the game. And under B, it's just saying that the umpire uh, in chief can be the sole judge. Sole judge. That's key right there too. I think <laughs> he is the judge what whether play continues. If you have a board member coming up, <clears throat> now keep this in mind too. If a board member comes up and says, "Hey, I saw lightning," yeah, he has a right to stop that game. Uh, this is more talking about the condition of the field, whether a kid's sl sliding unsafely, or he's slipping off the mound trying to pitch. Or the catcher catcher's doing a split every time and, and possible injury. That's what we're talking about more of the sole judge as far as that kind of stuff goes. So that's that's what they're talking about on that one. Okay. Rule 312. I just want to emphasize this, and this has already been talked about plenty of times. <clears throat> Everybody thinks as soon as they get the ball in the infield, they can call time. And a lot of that we teach from coach's pitch, okay? But it's only time when the umpire says time. It says it clearly right here. When the umpire suspends play, time shall be called. Okay, so time is by the umpire. You can ask for it. Hey, time, time, I need to tie my shoe or something like that. The umpire grants it. So if he didn't give it, or if a batter's in the box, he says time, and you don't give it, I mean, it, it's up to you. All this plays in. It's the umpire saying time is when you actually have time. So that's why I like to emphasize that one. That's well. a good thing to, to talk over with the uh, 
coaches before the start of the game, isn't it? Um, absolutely. Um, if, if you if you feel it's necessary, I, I don't think it's always necessary, but sure. I mean, anything that you want, you think would be, especially if you had a couple teams, or you've gone through. What, what, I mean, once we've gone through six eight teams, uh, and you've already gone through all the teams in the se or th six eight games, you're already going to ha have seen every team. At that point, there's no need to br bring it up. But yeah, maybe initially at the beginning of the year, I think that's a great thing. There's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't ever hurt because it's kind of like what Barry and I say. You know, you never mention something, but then or Chuck also, you never say anything, and all of a sudden it's going to happen to you. <laughs> In the next game, it'll happen to us. So, so yeah, absolutely. Anything that you want to bring up in the middle of a, a, a plate meeting or something like that. I just don't want the plate meeting to last 15 minutes <laughs> at the same time, you know what I'm saying? But it is a good thing for them to know. Not, I mean, by by every stretch of the imagination, anything that you can school them. But hopefully, I mean, I'm only hoping they watch these. They go back and watch some of these rules things so we can cover this kind of stuff. And a lot of it would already be covered. And it's, it's a good reference point, too, to say, hey, look, go to back to – Michael Daniels uh, YouTube channel and go watch any one of these. They're, I mean, I'm not erasing them. They're all sitting there. You can go back and watch any one of them at repeat. And usually down in the discussions, I'll have times of when each different thing happens. So to, when we bring up points on certain things, they can actually find what they're looking for. I try and make it. I try and make it as really as easy as I can. It's really kind of a cool tool. But good and most, point. And, and most of the uh, uh, coaches are pretty good about they'll say time blue before they come out on the field you know they don't just run out there most yeah. of them are pretty good about yeah yeah you're right in literally that, in little league they that he's you're talking about or jerry. jerry is that what you were talking about well yeah uh just uh i uh, i would say <clears throat> if, if the coach wants time he he could give the uh the time signal like this, you know, uh, uh, and that he's ask, that's asking for it, or he can verbally ask for it. But uh, yeah, just uh, make them notice that uh, that it's not they're not calling time that the umpire is. Yeah, uh, absolutely. No, yeah. I, I agree with you there. Yeah. Now, I I, I guess I kind of misunderstood. I'm just talking about time to tie a shoe or something like that. Something very vague. But yes, absolutely, or time because I got a runner that's trying to steal or something like that. I mean, all those kind of things. But yeah, time isn't granted till you give it, and you know, it, 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 obviously, you don't want them storming out of the dugout on you or anything like that. And we really rarely have that. But again, as soon as I say that, our first game, <laughs> first game, <laughs> opening day, we'll have somebody that just, uh, unloads on us. So. <laughs> All right. Does that answer pretty much what you got there? Let me, uh, yeah. I'll go, all right. I'll go on to, let me lock on to, here we go. Okay. So rule 315, we allow um, photographers out on the field. These got, these are, we do a yearbook at the end of the season every year. So we allow photographers, one from each team. Um, and it, it can be more than one person. That's fine. But the thing is, is they need to be past the door, way down the opening door where you come into the fields and they need to be down there and out of along the fence etc there is no dead ball area this rule covers it right here um, it's no person shall be allowed it says that it was set for the photographers that's why I highlighted the uh, photographers um, should an overthrown ball let me see if I can pull that shown an overthrown ball accidentally touch any authorized person it will not be considered interference and the ball will remain live I wanted to emphasize that because it's not a dead ball area and it's not considered that so if it hits their camera equipment or them or anything it's still a live ball so okay. you want them standing at the gate uh, beyond the the uh, dugout is that is that correct yeah the one where you enter the field the only there's only two entrances where you can enter the field right. they need to be past that Okay. If they come if they come up while they're warming up between innings, I don't have a problem with that because then okay. you can get a close up of the pitcher, close up of the catcher. Uh, as long as they're out of harm's way, there's no reason to get anybody hurt. And the other thing is, is make sure that they have a volunteer form. Most most parents, I think almost the whole league has a volunteer form filled out. 
And what that does is basically just covers them while they're out there shagging balls or at practices uh, to help the coach be in the dugout, any of that kind of stuff. So we really cover a lot of that stuff when they first come. Okay. And, and join so as, as a parent, so uh, that's going to help out. So that's kind of cool. All right, let me get what's next. Let's see. Rule 317. The biggest thing here, and I again, I think I've repeated this a couple times through some of these. Um, bat boys and bat girls are not permitted. They're, almost everywhere else, there's they, they have bat boys, bat girls, whatever. And Little League does not allow that. And I think it's a safety thing, mostly. Uh, the use of uh, electronic equipment during the game is restricted. Um, this is something that they really emphasize during tournament time. Uh, most dads come straight from work. They have their cell phone on their belt, all that kind of stuff. This is mainly for a guy that gets kicked out. He doesn't have a way to communicate to you know his coach off the field and things like that. Plus, you don't want a guy out there talking on a cell phone when a kid's at bat and gets nailed that kind of thing too so all this is discussed right here and, it, and it, it's pretty clear you know they don't want you doing that kind of stuff <clears throat> and it's especially like you don't want a somebody who has game changer game changers again where they keep score on their cell phone or iPad or something like that you don't want them out there on the bases with that they wouldn't be able to do, use that on the bases and the key is there, again, they're not going to be paying attention. They're going to be down trying to enter the score. Anything that takes their awareness away from the game, I don't think is a good thing anyway. Plus, they need to be coaching their kids <laughs> as well. So that that's the emphasis there. That's it. That's, the, uh, that's all the rules that I have for tonight. Um, let's... Uh, Okay, cool. Let's open it up for discussion. Um, Barry, I know you asked me a question before beforehand. You can go ahead and fire that away if you have. Uh, okay, Here, here's the scenario. You've got a runner on base. Doesn't really matter where. Ball's hit. The ball hits the runner where it's interference. Okay. What happens to the ball at that point? Is it a live ball, delayed dead, delayed dead ball, or is it dead right off the bat? Okay, it's a great question. As long as the player is hit in fair territory, in fair territory, he is hit like because he could be standing on first with his body outside of first base. Right. Well, this just it's a foul uh, then it's ball. It's a foul ball. That's exactly right. But as long as he's standing on the base and the ball hits him in fair territory, the, where the runner's out. Exactly. Offensive interference is an immediate. Any offensive interference is an immediate dead ball. All right. Well, and and runners go back and nobody can score and all that kind of stuff. So what happens to the batter? Batter takes first base. The runner that got hit with the ball is out. He goes in and the runner batter runner goes to first base. So if there's a man on second and third, the guy going from second to third gets hit. The batter goes to first, the runner on third goes back to third. The That's runner correct. on second's out. That's right, because on interference you cannot score. Okay. You can never score on interference. Good question though. Good question. Excellent. I love it. All right, let's see. Who else? Anybody else? Anybody else have any questions? Anything that's come up that you wanted to ask or anything? I knew it'd be a short one because I knew Rule Three was pretty short as far as not a whole lot to go over. It was pretty basic. I think I think next week is Rule Four and it's pretty long, so that'll be a fun one. We'll get into some stuff. One thing I will say: if you guys do do any scrimmages or anybody has any scrimmages or any managers that that are out there that want to send in, um. Uh, a request for questions to be asked on here, we can do that too. I mean, some people are just too shy. Or they don't want to get out here and do it. I don't have a problem with that. Just come on, ask us questions. We'll be glad to answer. 
whatever, whatever you like. I'm I'm all for that because it, any kind of uh, any kind of uh, engagement or we can sit there and discuss at least I know that people are involved and they want to know the right thing so that's that's the whole reason why I'm doing this so if we can get this and get people to do this that'd be great so all right what have else the, have the schedules been set yet the game schedules have been the game schedules are done as far as umpire schedule I put it right on the game schedule so um, I, let me let me see if I can pull that up so you can kind of get an idea of what it looks like. Um, Chuck and Barry already know this, so let me go to okay game schedule, and I'll screen share it as soon as it comes up. Okay. Okay. Can you see that there? Uh, yeah. Well, I, I did it just yeah. blur a little bit, but <clears throat> basically, let me see if I can. I'll scroll it up a little bit, make it a little bit bigger. There we go. Basically, it has the games down, and then it has a plate and a base guy. This year, obviously, we're not doing a base guy, so we'll have a plate guy, and then any blank area will have names. And I do this every week. I will do it for you. Can see we're going to have opening day is Saturday. And then Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, because we have um, Easter weekend that next weekend. So we only have Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. Then we skip Easter Sunday, and then we start Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. There will be no games on Friday except for T-ball, except maybe a rain makeup. Or Wednesday might be a rain makeup, too. We have that day in there for rain makeups if needed. So that's the way the schedule is. Your name will be right here off to the side. You can see me putting the little blue squares out there. That's uh, where your name will be. And you look, just look at this page. I will share this page with all of you so you can look at it any time. It's a public thing anyway. It will be on Northwood's website, which is northwoodbaseball.com. Um, so this will always be posted and out there. And I'll make notes of these things so you guys can have it. Uh, so you can reference back to this if you want to come back to this uh, YouTube video because that's the way it's going to save as a YouTube video. Um, and you can see, you'll be able to see uh, exactly um, that. So it's out there now if I go to northwoodbaseball.com? Should be. Okay. Should be, yeah. Yep, should be. Um, I, I believe they've got the new one on there. It might have the old one on there, but uh, opening day is very soon. It's like the 21st, I believe. We're having it at Eastside High School. And then the 23rd is our first Saturday of games. So, yeah, it's going to be really neat. Uh, first time this year we're trying that is the opening day at Eastside after the Eastside Riverside game then all the kids are going to line up and do the parade and come out there and stuff. So it should be should be for a lot of fun. I, hopefully a big money maker for Eastside and Riverside too. So get some get some draw there from kids that will be playing there eventually. <laughs> you know? So. Just, I, I do have another, this is, I, I mean, I've been a plate umpire, but what what are some of the basic stuff you cover at home plate? Give me an example of how I can answer that. I mean, there's a lot of stuff to cover, but... Oh, you mean but, talking about at the meeting? Yes. Oh, okay. The, the plate meeting? Yes. When I do a plate meeting, what I like to do is, I first off, I like to say, you know, hey, guys, we do the Little League Pledge. You always do the yes. Little League Pledge. Um, after that, coaches come here for a second. I take their lineup. I say, this, this is the lineup you have. Is everybody here? And you check for the pitchers. Yep, a check for pitchers, val uh, available pitchers. That's exactly right. And then if this, if he says, "Hey, look, that number, that guy in the five spot, is not here yet," but I, I'm going to go ahead and start him because, um, uh, he's he's on his way. He's in traffic. That's usually when I say, "Let's just move him down the end." Then, let's yeah. go ahead and move him down the end because I don't want anything to come up. Even though you skip him. It doesn't really matter. In Little League, you don't call an out. 
you always skip them, so it really doesn't. But but I I solve that right there. Mm -hmm. Okay. The other thing that I do at the plate meeting is I verify um, that they only have players and uh, coaches in the dugout. If they have their scorekeeper in there or someone in there to watch the kids while there's two coaches on the bases, that's perfectly fine. As long, even if you know some one of the dads didn't show up, one of the assistants isn't there, that's fine. Go ahead, throw a dad in there to ki watch the kids. Someone has to stay in the dugout at all times, so that's when I emphasize that. The other thing is, I say start time is you know whatever time it is right now. It doesn't matter. We have a dead hard stop at seven. Oh, what's that? I'm sorry. Did you ask a question? I'm sorry. Who, me? No, I, I oh. My audio went out. You said you verify what at, at the home plate? Uh, well, I don't know which part when it uh, went out, but I verify the, the pitchers that are going to be pitching. I verify that they're going to have uh, three coaches in the dugout. What else did I say? Oh, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because you have to have somebody in the dugout at all times with the kids. <clears throat> okay. And a dead stop in an hour and a half. Yeah, I, I let them know that there's a dead hard stop at 7, not in an hour and a half. Because if they start at 538, it's yeah. a dead hard stop at 7. Because we have to be able to get 15 minutes to be ready to start at 715 for the later games. Right. That changed this year, 715. So 715 to a dead hard stop at 9 at night. There's no give me's or anything it's dead hard stopping and this is at Northwood so anybody out there watching in the district yours may be different and that kind of stuff so I have to clarify that but this is at Northwood what we have so the first game starts at 530 supposed to yes and the second game starts at 715 yes supposed to but if it doesn't it doesn't matter the dead hard stops are still dead hard stops so the second game really gets an hour and 45 Hour and a half, isn't it? Seven fifteen. No, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it does. Yeah, hour and forty five. But those are always the minors and majors. Right. All co it's pretty much. I think he's got the whole thing. Of, and just looking at the schedule, it's always going to be an early coaches pitch game, and it's always going to be a minors and majors after it for the late games. Okay. There's a couple times maybe where you have a minors game backed up by a minors game, but that's going to be rare. All right, and really, you don't need to change. So you could actually make that game go to seven fifteen and just do them both that way. Yeah, you you could because you don't have to change. Go get a bite to eat real quick and come back or something. But we can deal with that on a game to game basis because it's not going to happen that often. And Saturdays are pretty much two coaches pitch games and a minor two minors games or coaches two coaches pitch games and a two majors games. Whatever. That's the way that Saturday is going to set up. So. All right, so you go over start, dead stop. What else? Yeah. Uh, the only other thing that I, I mean, it, it, you can go over more than that. I try and make sure that everybody's legally and properly equipped, and, and I look at, down at my catcher, make sure that he's got a dangling throat protector and also the extended chest protector. If he doesn't have that, for some reason the equipment guy didn't give that. If it's a coach's pitch game, I want to make sure that that kid, on pitcher, kid pitcher has a helmet and go over that. Just reminders of uh, no extra kids in the dugout, no siblings, none of that kind of stuff. I usually cover that. Because so really, yeah. there's no dead ball area in at Northwood. Well, just if it goes in the dugout. But I mean, inside the fence. No, there's really not. I mean, there, there isn't. And um, I, I like to always uh, make sure that to keep kids out of the face of that dugout too. Line yeah. shot. Line shot can come through there. That's a lot. Sometimes I'll talk about that at the plate meeting too. I say I want that coach in the dugout to actually pay attention to those kids over there, yeah. As opposed to just letting the kids float their heads out and half the bat out, and then they're not paying attention to the game and get hit with a ball or something. So I do that. The only other thing, like I said, I'm trying to think of anything else I talk about as far as. can't think of anything, but I'm sure there's something else. Um, I mean, I might talk to him about, say, hey, listen, make sure I get to know pitch count. I'll check scores. Who's the home score book? Find out that kind of stuff because uh, I need. I want to try and maintain that throughout the game if I can. Uh, make sure, you know, and get I, I don't even know if I said this. Did I said get a lineup. 
Yeah, I think I did. The very first thing I said, get a lineup. Absolutely have the lineup so you know whether somebody's batting out of order. Right. Because it doesn't matter what a scorebook or a coach has. It matters what who has. You have. Yeah. Because <laughs> you're the one that has the official lineup, so yeah. get a lineup each time. So. They can easily change it. <laughs> yeah, sure can. Sure can. Um, I was trying to think of uh, what was uh, any other rule that you've had comes up. You can always emphasize that, too. I do those kind of things. Uh, no, minors, coaches can be outside the dugout. Oh, this is one I always mention, but I want them along the fence. If they start abusing that, then I'm going to put them in the dugout because nothing says that I have to let them out. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with uh, manager and majors. He, you're allowed to have one manager outside on a bucket right outside the door so he can get up back up in there. By the end of the season, this gets... <laughs> the the coach starts moving further, further, further toward his catcher. Yeah. Um, we really need to try and emphasize that because that's a strict little league rule as far as safety and stuff. And he doesn't really need to be out there anyway. As long as you're out in the face of the face of the dugout, you can see your catcher. You should be good. That's, at least that's my my thoughts on it. Yeah. I mean, there's a few times I've said we won't argue ball strike, safe outs, rule interpretation, call time. And we can discuss it. Absolutely, those are always good things to say. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and I've even gone to the extent to say, look, I'm we're going to make an out. I'm going to make an out call, and especially with one umpire now, I would definitely say, uh, look, I've got one umpire. I'm blocked in a lot of situations. I'm making the call, and whatever I've got, we stick to. And I don't want to hear anything from your parents or your parents. And as soon as I do, there's absolutely no tolerance here. Yeah, just. If you do that in a plate meeting, a lot of that's covered. You don't have to worry about it, so that's a nice thing. Um, so, yeah, that's a, that's a good plate meeting. Um, trying to think of anything else that would come up. And, and you're going to find that, man, you know what? I'm going to say that next time at my plate meeting. Or, you know you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I do that kind of stuff all the time. I used to start right on the back of a card. So I'd have my plate meeting. i just have it, and I'm ready to go especially when you're trying to go over certain rules or or somebody. All these rules we're discussing, these guys don't always know all those. So sometimes you can teach each time. So that's kind of what I, that's kind of the process that I go through. Use a rule that you've had in the past that you really want to emphasize with these guys at this time. You can do that during your plate meetings. But again, I don't want the plate meeting to be 15 minutes and the kids aren't playing. One right. thing that one thing I don't like to do when you're doing a plate meeting is to have the kids up there warming up. I like to get my plate meeting either before the pledge or right after and just explain to them, we're going to get this done real quick. Because it doesn't need to be more than four or five minutes. Right. It really doesn't. What else? Chuck, would you add anything that you've done in the past that you think would be good for a plate meeting? Or even Jerry. Jerry, I know you've had some experience too. But Chuck, what do you think? It pretty much covered everything that really needs to be uh, brought up. Okay. Yeah, you don't want to drag it out too long. Yeah, you, you end up you're spending more time at a plate meeting than, and if it's a minors game, you're never going to get all the innings in and stuff like that. I try and I try and do everything I can for the kids. That's the way I my approach is. Everything I can. Um. I mean, I it, you know I, I'm there already, so that's the way I look at it. Hey. Mm -hmm. We're here for them. Let's 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 let them play or whatever. That's kind of my philosophy. Whenever I use, go at this stuff. What else? Well, I was gonna say I can cover that in less than a minute. <laughs> there you go. There you go. There you go. See, you'd be surprised though, because then they'll ask questions. Oh, what about this? And then <laughs> so then you're going through. Oh well, no, you can't do that. <laughs> and my first plate meeting will be 15 minutes. Yeah. Late. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, at least you have everything covered. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. I, I a lot of times I'll even say, "Hey, listen, in between innings, you got one minute or eight pitches. That's a good one to throw in there because I like to keep games moving." I've had a coach say to me, "Say my pitcher said that you only gave him two warm-up pitches." I said, "I know, but he took three minutes to get out here. You know what? He got or two pitches, he, and I was fine." He threw it to home. Home yeah. missed it. 
who went and get it, threw it over his head. It's in, yeah. in the outfield. Well, you know. Yeah, and and I don't have a problem with that one more than I do them not being there. Yeah. You know that one. I want him ready to go. <laughs> the one that's always gets me is the in, in minors the catcher. It it always takes forever. Yeah, exactly. That's why I made the point of two outs mandatory. Yeah. But for and it doesn't always help because sometimes he's on base or whatever. Or he's he's next up the bat. Yeah, that's right. So anyway, what else? anybody got anybody have anything else? We're good. I'm sure I'll think of something tomorrow. That's fine. All right, I'm going to end the broadcast. But if you guys will stay in the green room with me afterward, that'd be fine. I'll let you know when it has ended. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. <laughs>